Good afternoon, SAD Nation. This is Gavin with the Tennessee Regional State Manager for SAD. And on this call today, we are, as it is National Teen Driver Safety Week, we have four amazing uh, State Farm agents with us to talk about some areas of teen driving. And we want to welcome them. So first I have on the call is Sage from Knoxville. I have Alicia from Germantown. I have Jeff from Mount Juliet, and I also have Josh from Farragut, Tennessee. So they're going to give you insight into these topics. They are going to help um, further understand all things that we're going to talk about. So the first thing we're going to talk about is new car technology. So Sage, I got a question. A lot of these cars these days are smarter than this smartphone that I have in my hand. And I am just very curious. Have you seen the fall off of education with um, kids driving their parents' new fancy ride and not really understanding the technology that is in that car? And so I, I just want to hear, like, wh what have you seen from your side and how important is it for these parents and these kids to understand the new technology? Well, what's funny about that is – Truly, the kids seem to get it quicker than their parents sometimes. Um, it, you know, it's that whole joke about, uh, you know, get a 12-year-old in and they can help you with all your tech problems. But the truth of the matter is, is um, if parents aren't teaching their kids about all this new technology, lane assist, and the fact that if you have it on cruise control, it could hit the brakes if you're getting too close to the car in front of you, um, then that comes as a surprise to the kids. And, and the biggest issue that we have, and I think we're going to talk about it a little bit later, is distracted driving. Well, that can be very distracting. If you don't understand what's going on with the car, um, the interesting thing, at least here in um, Knox County, we have over 30 schools, 30 high schools, that um, only 30% of them still offer driver's training. So, you know, they're, they're not getting it in the school. And in addition to that, I've spoken with some of the teachers. They don't have the newest, latest, up-to-date model cars. That's not what they get donated or have to purchase. So the kids aren't getting in and driving driver training classes. Um, the parents really do have to spend some time to make sure they understand it themselves so that they can uh, pass that information along to kids. Have you have you seen any do you have you experienced any stories or of bad things happening because students are getting behind these fancy cars and not understanding or being being distracted with the new technology? Yeah. So the interesting thing to me, and I don't know if it's because it's not as prevalent as it will be in the future, I haven't run into the teenagers having those problems. I've had those problems. <laughs> so my funny story about it is um, my husband's car does all that stuff. And last year I was driving to Charlotte in his car and I felt like I was in a four hour wrestling match because the truth of the matter is, is um, they had some construction through the mountains in North Carolina and they didn't really have the lanes um, clearly marked. And my car or my husband's car kept telling me I was out of my lane. So I'm, you know, doing like this to get into the real lane and it's trying to tell me I'm not in the right lane. And I, like I said, I'm really pleased that I made it out. Um, so I guess the reality is we're going to see more and more of this. I think one of my biggest concerns about all of this autonomous technology is complacency. I think that we're going to see kids and adults just sitting back and saying, hey, my car does it all. Maybe I'll read a book or, I mean, have you heard that some cars actually you can now get on the internet in your dashboard? Yeah. Well, that's crazy. We know that distracted driving is a bad idea. So that whole technology really does make me nervous. And I think it probably makes the industry nervous as well as what will happen to rates because of what happens to accidents. Gavin, I've been driving a long time, man. I've got a 16 year old driver. I still have a problem with the navigation system when you're on the interstate and you get to, all right, where do I turn? Where do I, you know, and that's something I have to practice with my 16 year old son, even now. And so it's, it's good stuff being on the interstate with some technology that you still have to get used to, even, you know, if you're an experienced driver, you know, can affect us too. Exactly. 
Exactly. I think one of the scariest realizations was when I was driving next to a Tesla here in Nashville and you saw no hands on the steering wheel and he was on his phone and just chilling like he was sitting on a couch on a Sunday. And it was just the scariest thing. I slowed down and I just let him go right in front of me because it was it was scary Um, because you're just not used to it. But it's the real thing now. So so talk about Tesla's. Uh, I have a friend of mine who um, she's actually VP of Tesla out in California. And she showed us her car that um, literally you can hit a button, it'll play a song and it'll dance. Like the, the, the doors will open up and it'll bounce. And I mean, you can code your car to dance. Wow. My son just turned 16 in June and started driving. And that's the thing he's already said. It's like, mom, why can't I get a car that drives itself so I can do <laughs> things on my phone or all the, I'm like, no. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, my uh, my six year old is asking me when 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 am I going to get a Tesla? And so yeah, I mean it's it's crazy the way they market and push to that younger generation. Man, these kiddos know what I didn't. I, I mean, at six years old, I, I don't even think I knew what a Chevy truck was. And so for a, a six year old to already know uh, what a Tesla is and, and what all it does is it's a, it's crazy. The marketing is impressive. Yeah. So my next question is about distracted driving. And I'm actually going to go to Josh for this one. So in today's world, there are so many distracted distractions as we're talking, as we just talked about. So from their phones to just videoing what's going on in the road, I'm guilty of it because sometimes I see something funky happening and I just want to get it on my Instagram story. So there are so many distractions in today's world. Just talk about um, the hands-free law and all the stuff that goes into distracted driving and just some advice for teenagers, for parents of how to combat these things so that they don't find themselves behind the wheel and then in a split second, something happens. Yeah, hands-free. I mean, you think about, you know, most people, when they think about hands-free, um, they think about their cell phone, right? And so the, the first thing that comes to mind is like, okay, I've got, I've got my cell phone, and I've got to figure out how not to pay attention to that in the car. What they forget about is maybe the cup of coffee, right? Or the cup of coffee they got to pull up, or or maybe it's maybe it's the uh, last minute stop to get breakfast before you get to work. Um, or the the most important topic where we see a lot of our claims from State Farm side is from kiddos in the back seat, and so the. The children in the back seat, the ones that you have to show attention to at all times or, or throughout the trip, it's 12 times or 12 times likely to be distracted due to your kiddos behind you versus your cell phone. Um, and that's alarming. So, you know, we have to do a better job, you know, nationally just educating our young drivers that, hey, guys, it, we're, we're not just talking about your cell phone. We're talking about, hey, we need both hands on the wheel and truly focused uh, on the trip. And, and another thing that's, that distracted driving leads to is, is more daydreaming. I mean, in the hustle and bustle of life and, uh, and just trying to get, get to A to Z as quick as you possibly can, um, you're so focused on Z that you forget about the other four stops along the way. And then you get there and you're just like, oh my gosh, like what just happened to you know, 40% of my trip? Um, and that's, that's another alarming factor when it comes to uh, distracted driving. I think young kids, like young teenage drivers, they forget that we've been where they're at. Uh, we used to drive with a bunch of people in our car and it was distracting. Uh, so, I mean, you know, our kids are teenage drivers. They may get upset when we say, Hey man, nobody else in your car, but this is the most dangerous thing they can do at this point in their life. So uh, we're just trying to make sure they understand the importance of, you know, staying attentive to the road. And uh, when you have a bunch of people, I don't care, even as an older adult like me, my kids or whoever's in the car, I tend to, you know, I tend to get distracted talking to them. And um, it's, it's everybody does. Yeah. One of the reasons um, there's actually a law that many parents and certainly coaches are not aware of in the state of Tennessee. Gavin, do you know how many people can be in a car with a kid who is not 18 yet? Kid with a driver's license driving. He's not 18 yet. How many people, non-family members, is he allowed to have in the car? One. You got it. One. 
And how many times do you hear a coach say, hey, John, you take those three and head over to the practice or the game? And you, you can't do that. The other thing that I think a lot of people don't realize is we have a law in Tennessee that says until you're 18, even hands-free talking on the phone is illegal. Yeah. And, and I talk to parents all the time that don't realize that. So let's, let's actually jump into that. So Alicia, can you talk about the GDL laws? Because when I turned 16, it was the, and I grew up in Wisconsin, um, the GDL, GDL laws were just adopted in 2000. And I'm going to be honest with you. I never really actually paid attention. I didn't really know or even cared to be honest with you about the point system or about the GDL laws. Cause just like Sage just said, you just get parents, you get friends that say, Hey, I'm going to hop in your car and you're just going to let it roll because either you want to have a dance party rolling down the road or you're going to, you just all go into the same place and you don't think that you're going to get pulled over because cops aren't looking to bust people for GDL law. So in the GDL program. So can you just talk about the importance of understanding this and going from that, even from the teenager side to the parent side? Yeah, Gavin, so true. When I got my license, there was no such thing as GDL law. So you just go get your license. So when my son got his license in June, we obviously needed to be more prepared with what that looked like. So give me a little bit of an upper hand. So you have to hold your learner's permit for 180 days or six months. And as a parent, we now have to sign an affidavit that our child has driven 50 hours. Um, you know, you have driving schools that they can get some hours, but they're still not going to get that 50 hours. So as a parent signing that affidavit that states that we've been behind the wheel with them for at least 50 hours, it just gives them that experience with some different um, temperaments on the road, you know, whether it be snow, rain, et cetera, just give them some additional experiences. And Sage already touched on it, but on the um, – uh, restricted um, intermediate license you can only have one um, person in the car with you which is good it's a distraction um, to have multiple people in the vehicle people are chit-chatting they're you know handing stuff back and forth from the front seat to the back seat they're playing with the radio you know the volume in the car may get louder and therefore they get more distracted I think about that with actually you know my son he drives my daughter home every day and his um, best friend lives in our neighborhood and he's like Mom, he literally lives across the street from us. Can I not bring him home? And I'm like, no, you can't have more than one person. And the, the drive is only seven minutes. But like you mentioned, I mean, it's you're breaking the law. <laughs> you can only have that one person in the vehicle. Um, and then, you know, they can move on to the um, unrestricted license. Um, with the restricted, they also can't drive after 11 p.m. and before 6 a.m., um, which I'm not sure how many 16 and 17 year olds should be driving those hours anyway, but. <laughs> True. Um, so one of the, and we'll just keep on going with that. So uh, Jeff, so with drowsy driving, if teens are actually driving at that late at night, um, when it, uh, just educate just the teenagers and the parents when it's okay to say, hey, I'm just too tired. Can someone come pick me up? So they don't get behind the wheel because there's many times, you know, as an adult, we think, hey, we can, we can power through this and get home, or we have a long road trip with the family, we're just going to go, and we find ourselves getting drowsy behind the wheel, and it's so dangerous because you hear the stories of people falling asleep, hitting a tree, hitting another car. So can you just educate the teens and the parents about when it's okay to just say, hey, I'm too tired, let's pull over for a nap, or let's do something so that I'm not driving drowsy? Sure. Gavin, why is it when you're in a car, everybody goes to sleep? Like if you're on a trip with your family, everybody goes to sleep except the driver. My wife, like I just got back from Florida last week so true. and I turned around. And I'm like, well, I was like, everybody's asleep except me. So I, and you don't have to be at night. You know, it could be any time of the day, man. Actually, probably I get more drowsy a lot of times driving during the day. Um, so a couple couple things that work for me. Uh, one, if I'm driving with somebody, it's always cool to be able to talk to somebody. Uh, so my wife, you know, she tends to try to stay awake with me. So if you're a teen driver, you have somebody else in the car, encourage them to stay awake, you know, and so you guys can, you know, check each other. Okay. Um, you know, if you get sleepy, be able to communicate with somebody, chewing gum, get something to drink, uh, straighten your chair up in your, in your, uh, your seat in your car, uh, you know, roll the window down some, 
you know, there's various things you can do, but, uh, you know, I, I think the biggest thing is, is understand when you're getting drowsy, Hey, I've got to make an adjustment. I can't just keep doing what I'm doing yeah. here. Uh, because if I do, there's a good chance I may go to sleep. Turn the music up, put on some jams, something you like to sing to and blare it, man. Uh, that's what I like to do. But if I'm by myself, I get sleepy. Definitely go on. Turn the, turn the tunes up, start singing, be, be your best, uh, I don't know, karaoke there in the car. Nobody's, nobody's there with you. So that would be a suggestion. Kevin, I would say for team drivers, just being like more intentional with setting those boundaries for times. You know, I shouldn't be allowing my 16-year-old son to be driving hours that he probably is tired. But maybe he's coming home from basketball practice and he's just, you know, exhausted or whatever the case may be. Just setting good boundaries with him, like, you know, if you're tired, do not hesitate to call me and we can come pick you up. I mean, because your life can change for the rest of your life in three seconds. It's not worth it. Do not drive. We started a program here in um, our area because there was a young lady that had passed away from um, driving drowsy. And so now we have signs all over our city um, that remind you not to drive drowsy. It's just the same as driving intoxicated. Your body's still experiencing the same effects. And, you know, even encouraging them to just get out of the car and stop and stretch, you know, stretch, get a breath of fresh air and then get back in the car when you're, you know, not so sleepy and exhausted. I think Alicia and I are in the same boat. I've got a 16 year old son who just started driving in June as well. But, you know, you, you need to be a parent um, and, and the, the drivers need to understand that you know, we have a responsibility as parents to tell, you know, tell you when a good time to be home is and, uh, so, and you know, at some point, I, I want my kids to, to to love me, enjoy me, and think I'm a great dad. But also, I've got to set some boundaries, like Alicia said. You know, what? And, and that could be different from night to night. But you know, Friday night football. Hey, maybe we extend that time out for a little bit longer. But at the same time, we just still have to have boundaries for, and it's to protect the, protect the kids. So, one of the saddest stories I have had um, here recently uh, as a young kid who just uh, amazing he's 17 and i'm going to first say he's he's alive um but his life has changed because he was a straight a student he was on the baseball team he um, had gone through paramedic assistant training and was doing that as well and he was just doing too much and he was coming home from a class in the middle of the afternoon and fell asleep crossed over into the oncoming traffic, had a head-on collision. Um, the good news is, is the other car, they were okay after some injuries, but he broke his back wow. and he could never play baseball again. And he lost his scholarships that he was expecting to get for college, all because he was driving when he knew he was tired. He had just been pushing too hard. Uh, the last thing I would say on that subject, Gavin, is – is also you need to understand it's the responsibility of driving. It's not just about you, uh, but my family could be driving down the road with my three kids and my wife in there and you fall asleep. So it's a great responsibility that, yeah, I could hurt myself, but I also could hurt other people. Um, so that's one thing I would encourage, you know, make sure we don't drive when we're sleepy. Kevin, we, um, we try to meet with all of our, our youthful drivers when they turn 16. Um, as the State Farm agents, we have a great program to sit down with them and educate them, go over scenarios and situations, and then that Steer Clear program kind of gives them some stories, but always try to pull stories out of them because if they have someone that they've experienced has walked through something difficult, then it becomes more real for them. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, we had the, the tragedy of losing a young student at my kid's school last year. And I think that as, as awful as it is, I think it woke a lot of children up um, to what can happen because it became real. It's something that they experienced and they walked through. So, you know, being able to have them share stories where they can have empathy and relate to, to realize that it can happen so quickly and it's not some person far out that they don't know. I just want to open up about the mental health aspect because yeah. mental health is a very real thing. And as we're talking about drowsy driving and not getting behind the wheel, Josh, do you want to touch on just a matter of when it's okay to say I'm not okay to drive because my mental state is just not good. Mental health is very important and it's becoming more prevalent in today's day and age. And so can you just talk about that? 
Yeah, I mean, I think it's a big deal, right? I mean, you know, um, I think the emotional side to driving is just as important um, as if you felt drowsy. I mean, I know know drowsy, being drowsy and driving is a big topic, right? Um, But also being emotionally drained um, or irritable due to a situation that just took place, or maybe your stress level at an all-time high, um, jumping in a car is not a good match. Um, you know, it's not, it's not like peanut butter and jelly, right? So we got to we gotta have a better match when we're jumping in the car if we are sh- upset. Maybe, maybe, the, maybe you're upset at your parents, right? Um, you just had, a, you know, had an argument or upset with your coach or um, upset with a friend or a girlfriend or boyfriend or whatever it may be. Um, just take a timeout, right? I mean, just like, let's pause. Let's take a timeout um, before we jump in the car. You know, let's take a walk, a jog, whatever you need to do to just relieve some of that stress before you get behind the wheel. It's a big deal. I mean, because, you know, some topics I, some topics I put together, I was looking at, if, if you are, if stress is overtaking the, the trip, um, you know, here's, here's some things that could happen. Missing a red light or a stop sign, um, you know, strike a pedestrian, um, drive or drift into another lane. So there's, there's multiple things that could take place um, during your trip um, if, if you're driving with a, an all-time high stress level. Awesome. It's a big topic. Does anyone have anything, any stories or anything they want to share with the students or the parents before we close out this video? And I just want to say thank you to all of you for joining. But does anyone yeah. have anything, last things to say? I just say don't take anything for granted, parents out there. Uh, you know, simple things like like how do I operate navigation? I bought my son a new car. New, well, no, it's not new, but I had navigation with it but the home button doesn't take him to his house, you know, things like that. You're like, you know, how do you, you know what I mean? How do you turn the windshield wipers on? Cause everything's automatic these days. What happens? I'm literally driving with my son. It starts raining. It's a new truck. He, he's not used to driving. It starts raining and he don't know how to turn the windshield. Wipers on. I'm like, Oh man, I forgot to do that. I forgot to tell you how to do that. And I don't want to tell you how to do it when it's raining. So <laughs> needless to say, I was in the passenger seat saying, Oh my gosh, where's it at? <laughs> so anyway, the, the little things, you really need to test your, your vehicle out. It's, it's specific to your car, whatever they're driving. So that would be a thing that I would suggest for sure. I would just say driving's a privilege and not a right. And just to remember that, you know, and not, like you said, not to take it for granted. And for, you know, parents, Jeff hit the nail on the head, like we have to do a better job of educating our children and reminding them of the things that they could come across. You know, for example, when it starts raining, the first 30 minutes of the rain is when it's the worst because the water and the oil from the street are mixing, so the road becomes more slick. And so just being more cautious of those and getting our children out in different environments with different people in the car because they're going to experience different things with my 12-year-old daughter versus my husband, right? She's going to be talking his ear off and wanting to play all the fun songs and allowing him to get more comfortable Um, and bring his anxiety and emotions down as he learns to experience more things on the road and even just their trips you know like not allowing them to take longer trips when they're on their own in the beginning until they have more miles on the road to be more experienced in that drive all right well i just want to say thank you to all of you and students uh sad nation hope you enjoyed this state farm thank you again and hope you guys are enjoying your national team driver safety week all the footage and reminder tomorrow is car park karaoke so go park your car and sing some songs because it's going to be fun <laughs>